While I was playing Fallout 76, I did something I don't usually do. I started writing a script in the middle of a playthrough. I don't do this because I inevitably throw everything in those scripts out. In this instance, I mentioned this because I originally thought about starting this video with an olive branch to the 76 fans, who got a rough lot in life because the game they like had an infamously disastrous launch. But, once you decide on a title, X is worse than you know, you have committed yourself to war. Why that title, besides funding my Lambo collection with dirty clickbait dollars? Because this game has a mostly positive rating on Steam, thanks in part to a concerted effort to correct the record by 76 fans. There is an obsession with redemption stories in recent years. Can you believe Fallout 76 has been compared to No Man's Sky in terms of games that have been fixed by patching? I think that's insane, given the actual context of what happened in both stories. But I'm not just going to sit here and watch as a narrative gets pushed that Fallout 76 is anything more than a failed experiment, best left remembered only by those who catalog curiosities. Why even cover Fallout 76? Well, since I plan on taking a look at Starfield later this year, I felt it only fitting that I finally play Bethesda's most recent game. Yeah, I had very little interest in the game at release. At that point in time, I was already well off the train. I played about 30 minutes of a borrowed copy of Fallout 4, got to the power-armored wrestling match with the Deathclaw in the first town, and knew full well I was not the target demographic, so I saved my money and didn't bother playing the game until years later, at a heavy discount, when I still managed to softlock the game's main quest. When I heard that Bethesda was making another Fallout game, this time catered towards multiplayer and survival, I figured it would go poorly. I'm not going to pretend that I anticipated it would go that badly, it is hard to predict the unprecedented. They're really you know what's hot. insane about comments is like, it's a bunch of people that what's are- What's up with comments? That Lay are, it that down are like, about comments. You get your love, but then you also get a bunch of hate, but it's somebody that's staring at your face for three hours. Yeah, and it, 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 it's funny is that you get more hate than love about 90% of the time. Your usual corporate oopsie is one or two main events, followed by weeks of reveals about details of those events. This was Bethesda getting in trouble for something new almost every week for months on end. But I'm not gonna labor too hard on the incident. As big as I am on game history, what is striking about 76 is how big a shadow the launch has over what is actually inside the box. Which is why I wanted to play the game for myself instead of having a missing link between Fallout 4 and Starfield. My Fallout 76 playthrough was cooperative, done with private sessions, who is going to be creating his own video chronicling what happened during our playthrough. What the fuck? Yeah, that's not what it looks like on my screen. Mine is going to be more focused on the game itself. There is a somewhat fallacious argument that I've used in the past about things being, quote, fun with friends, end quote. While that is true, it's also true that four eyes are better than two. That is to say, whatever benefit Fallout 76 may have received from being played with a friend, were lost whenever the game would falter, leading to a tennis match of criticism. There's literally nothing to fuck do here. It's so unchallenging. Hello? Anybody home? <laughs> We've been wandering for 20 minutes. Would anybody like to interrupt us? And if we make some noise, let them know we're here. But yeah, we played the whole game together and yes, we will be getting married. If you want to attend the ceremony, you can come to the Charleston, West Virginia courthouse next Wednesday if it's not too busy. Just look for Esbert and Delphine, they are hard to miss. Is it fair to review Fallout 76 cooperatively when the common experience is solo? I would say, lol, there is no common experience. Things as simple as weather and quest triggers would often not synchronize correctly. Remember those updates we did where we would do the update and it was like everything had been cut? Entering an event area. Oh good, we need, uh, we need to complete like two more of those. And like many multiplayer games, your experience can vary based on what the current update is and what time of year you're playing. For example, we played during the Holiday Scorched event, and this included double experience. So it would be lame to try and say that our experience wasn't representative of the game because, frankly, I don't think such an experience actually exists. 
The game being multiplayer has formed a shield of sorts from criticism. Bethesda's earlier games were all single player, so it was easy for single players to justify their week-long binge playthrough by making a review afterwards. But a multiplayer game? Did you think I was playing Fallout 4 because I had friends? I think multiplayer is a shield we ought to take away before more and more developers drink the poison. Multiplayer games, especially ones with narratives, generally require a premise to explain why the multiplayer game is happening. In the real world, fully grown people don't just appear out of thin air and begin to grind. We raise those people for 18 years and then throw them out into the world to grind for themselves. Fallout, as a setting, generally uses the vault premise to explain the mysterious arrival of combat-aged outsiders. Vault 76 is a good start at a premise, but there are a few tweaks I would have made. As is typical for Bethesda, they could not help themselves and try to establish the protagonist syndrome early. Vault 76 is not a regular vault, it's not fully one of the experiment vaults, which is all Bethesda has ever done in their games, but it's not one of the rare control vaults either. Vault 76 was apparently filled with America's best and brightest, which the story itself suggests was an experiment in its own right. This is an unnecessary detail. If there was any game within which it would be best to establish the player as being one of many regular people, multiplayer Fallout was it. It's fine if you allow the player to become a prodigy through experience, but it should be a wink and nod that while each player is special, from their perspective they are one of the few who are. Unless Bethesda is trying to make a statement that a society made up of geniuses would inevitably fail, I do not see the narrative benefit of establishing not just that we are the chosen one, but that everyone who came out of Vault 76 was as well. And Appalachia is inherently built to fail. This is a prequel set 25 years after the war, meaning that no matter what we try to do and build New Virginia, it can't work. Because such a state does not exist in Fallout 3 and 4. Unless, of course, the statement that Vault 76 was filled with the best and brightest was actually ironic. There is nothing in the game to indicate this, however given the aforementioned failed state, as well as some of the decisions the DLC railroads us into making, I can actually believe that this was a vault packed to the brim with people who scored the minimum in every special stat. This is obviously a gameplay thing, but it is funny to imagine that we are the weakest, imperceptive, fragile, rudest, moronic, clumsy person to ever exist, and it goes without saying that we were born unlucky. However, an even bigger issue with Vault 76 is Reclamation Day. So we established that a minority of vaults were actually designed to house people to repopulate after the war. There were 17 control vaults out of 122 total. If Vault 76 was actually an experiment, then Bethesda has never done a control vault in any of their three Fallout games, despite featuring 19 vaults with numerical designations. However, Vault 76 has invented an additional feature, Reclamation Day. The vault was designed with planned obsolescence in order to force the residents to go recolonize the wasteland. So, 48 hours after Reclamation Day, the life support will shut down and kill anyone staying inside. This is really dumb, not just narratively, but also in terms of your premise. Vault 8 was a real deal control vault that did not house the best and brightest. It received the all clear from the Enclave after 14 years, after which residents used the still functional vault as an anchor to build a city. Vault 15 was an experiment vault that released its subjects after the conclusion of the test, a detail Bethesda seems to forget when they write their vaults who went on to found the city of Shady Sands, which now sits as the capital of the communist state of the New California Republic. I think the only reason Bethesda added the Reclamation Day clause is because they established a precedent with Vault 101 and 111 that people could live inside the vaults forever, so why would anyone ever want to leave? Of course, forgetting the plot of those games being about reasons why people would want to leave the vaults. Vault 76 should be a centralized hub area for the game. All the players are vault dwellers, so it would make sense that players would be allowed to use this as a common area to rent out vendor stalls, as well as having services and crafting stations here. You can leave the reason for us leaving blank, because obviously it's an opportunity to fill in details about our character. It gives you an opportunity to have human NPCs inside the vault, which doesn't affect the story in the slightest compared to the destruction that the Wastelanders DLC wrought, and it helps flesh out the character of the Overseer, since she left first to complete her mission. 
She has to make a choice between staying to administrate the vault and completing her mission. As is, it seems as though the Overseer is saying that if she can't be the Overseer, no one can. And so she's closing the vault to reinforce that. Not helped by the fact that she doesn't even have a name. Now, let's talk about that date. October 23rd, 2102. Originally, we were only supposed to be in the vault for 20 years. Which is strange because Vault 8 had planned for 10 years and got the all clear after 14. 25 years is an awkward amount of time and it's unfortunate that once again I find myself taking issue with specifically this number. If you were 20 years old when you entered the vault in 2077, then when you left the vault you would be 45 years old. However, remember we are the best and brightest. Of course, how do you quantify that? You would have to use accomplishments, which would generally mean education and achievements. If you were a soldier, then I imagine you would have to be in the military for years to establish yourself. If you were a scientist, then you would have to have completed a college education and distinguished yourself with years of research. If you were a doctor, then you would have to have lengthy education and years of practice. And all of these people apparently moved to and found jobs in West Virginia before the bombs fell. Meaning that most of the pre-war adults who would have left Vault 76 would have been too old. For reference, the regular people admitted into Vault 8 who were 20 when entering would have only been 34 years old when exiting. This compounds the issue of Reclamation Day and the qualifications. Since Vault 76 would have inevitably been converted into a nursing home to house the pre-war residents, Vault 8 would have also had a hard time with its age gap. It's just that they didn't close the vault doors behind them. Hell, we meet the Overseer and Wastelanders. She was hand-selected to complete a dangerous, combat-oriented mission after the vault's closing, but I've met people with kids fighting over their inheritance who look younger than her. Which, of course, is funny. In the original main quest line, we never meet the Overseer. In one of the logs, she is heavily injured without any stim packs. That's not to say I think she should have died. I mean, ask me that question when we get to her part in Wastelanders. Rather, meeting the Overseer early means that there can never be any suspense created about whether or not we're listening to the words of a dead woman. Because we know she's alive. Elderly. But alive. And then you have the Vault Babies. From the Overseer's Terminal, we know a couple of the geniuses had kids while inside the vault. If you were born in the first two years, then you would emerge on the planned date a full adult. The five-year delay wasn't decided until close to the original Reclamation Day, so most of the prospective parents would have been under the impression that any kids born after only a decade would be forced to leave the vault as children. 25 years is perfectly in the middle of an awkward generational gap where most of your geniuses coming out will be too old to do anything effectively, while most of your vault babies will be too young to participate. Especially since, remember, we're kicking all of them out to fend for themselves. In order to foster a future generation of children, most of the vault dwellers who want to have kids would need to do so before or while they were still in the vault. If the pre-war adults are coming out of the vault at a minimum of 45 years of age, that is far too old to wait until after New Virginia is founded. Meaning that most of the emerging Vault 76 dwellers would have to be parents actively raising children, who are having the only shelter and security taken away from them, and were not even supposed to receive a firearm. Nor does the Overseer's mission involve using a GEC. People are not only being forced to fend for themselves, but also their children and the elders, who would almost assuredly just be left for dead. The only narrative reason why 25 years as a minimum is necessary, sadly, is to explain why the Brotherhood of Steel is in the game. In other words, if the Brotherhood weren't in this game, then Reclamation Day could have happened much sooner. They also could have delayed Reclamation Day to a full 50 years, like Vault 15, in order for the Vault Babies to be given time to form into a fully independent generation, but then the Overseer couldn't be written as a pre-war character. Now, if Bethesda is intentionally doing this because they want to set up the Vault 76 dwellers for failure in order to preserve the continuity of Fallout 3 and 4, then I guess good job. The only way you could have made us less likely to succeed was if Reclamation Day was in the middle of winter, we weren't given jumpsuits or Pip-Boys, and the Mr. Handys started shooting the Vault Dwellers on the way out. You could make the case that the Enclave didn't actually care about rebuilding America through the Vaults, or that they didn't think the war was going to happen, so that is why Vault 76 is so poorly planned. 
Except that doesn't work because Vault 76 has a special, extremely important purpose. There are three nuclear missile silos in West Virginia, which are automated to the point that they can produce more missiles as they get used. Obviously, this is going to be of immense interest to the Enclave after the war, and really to pretty much everybody still living on planet Earth. The Overseer's mission is to secure these silos, and the Enclave was very serious about that. Like, break off your marriage because we think it'll compromise you, serious. Now, I'm not going to jump into the implications of that just yet, because we're still talking about the Vault, but that is a point in itself. We are still in the introduction of the game, and there are several key issues just in the premise, which scream that these details were quickly written down. What was Vault 76's experiment? Well, we need to let the people out so it can't have one. We don't have time to see if the concept already exists, so uh, we'll just say the experiment was that a bunch of smart people were inside the Vault. How long were they there? I don't know, 20 years sounds good. We'll say 25, but there was a delay to sell how dangerous it is out there. Uh, we don't have time to consider if West Virginia wasn't hit by very many nuclear weapons, that a more reasonable number like 10 years could be used. How do we explain why we aren't letting players go back into Vault 76 for no reason? Uh, we'll say that the vault was designed to fail to force people to go outside. Why would smart people leave the vault to colonize the beautiful and virtually untarnished Appalachian countryside when they could instead live in an underground vault their entire lives? They have to be forced out. Okay, so we are finally leaving the vault. I do have to appreciate that finally, after 16 years, I am playing a Bethesda game with a 10 minute intro. The game crashed. Okay, let's try that again. I do have to appreciate that finally, after 16, ah, crashed again. I thought this was gonna be a trend, so I started to count crashes, but actually there's just an issue with character creation where if you spend too long customizing your character, then the game will crash when you pick up the Pip-Boy. So I have to use a preset character, exit the vault, and then customize my character once I'm actually out in the game world where my progress will be saved. Despite that bad first impression, something this game also has in common with Morrowind is its stability. That's not to say it's a bug-free experience, just that my bug compilation would be significantly shorter than Joseph Anderson's. Bethesda has actually done a decent job of fixing issues experienced at launch. I'd say the game is now somewhere between Oblivion and Old Skyrim in terms of bugginess. Of course, there was a big profit incentive in fixing the game up. It wasn't done out of moral principle. The game has a microtransaction shop and subscription service to sell, and one of your main means of recruiting fresh blood would be to say that the bug infamous Fallout 76 has been repaired. Could we it's a, get up it's there? a shame levitation was never part of our blades training. I don't think we could <laughs> get up there. However, one of the things Anderson noted in his video on 76 was that the buggy experience superseded the game itself. In some ways, it was disappointing because there weren't very many glitches which made us laugh. It was mostly just minor technical issues that we would note were happening and then we'd move on. Probably the only funny thing is ironically a bug that Anderson documented with Power Armor. If another player gets into and out of Power Armor frequently, then occasionally you'll see their skeleton contort into this Junji Ito figure. The ironic part is that he only experienced this during his own cooperative playtime, meaning it's very well possible this bug didn't get fixed because it was a low priority issue, because only co-op players who used power armor would experience it, and Bethesda must have figured that it was too rare of an issue to receive priority. That is just speculation, but the point remains that it's rather humorous that removing the bug seems to have stripped one of the key features away, that being to experience a janky Bethesda game with your friends. I mean, a key feature of a burning dumpster is the fire. Put that out and it's just a box full of trash again. While I am not advocating that they leave the games broken, it's hard not to assume there was only an incentive for Bethesda to do the right thing and fix this one if it made them more money. Speaking of making money, today's video is sponsored by Skyrim. We're only a couple steps out of the vault, as Burn and Delphine meet up, searching for Parthenax after the Dragonborn spared him. That's when we see a sign inviting prospective customers down to a bar called The Wayward. I'm, I'm just, you know, we haven't left the area and already I have more things to talk about. This is Wastelanders, which was a major DLC that came out for the game 18 months post-launch. Very deliberately, the DLC is attempting to head off criticism by intercepting players before they can actually start playing the game and divert them into doing Wastelanders content first and the main quest afterwards, if at all. 
Wastelanders lies and tries to pretend that October 25th, 2102 was not the last time anyone could have emerged from Vault 76. The very basic premise, and Wastelanders is already abandoning it for no good reason. I'm sorry, am I seriously supposed to believe that my character overslept Reclamation Day by two years? If that is the case, then that means that Vault 76 is actually still fully functional, meaning that it could be converted into a habitat and used as a base of operations. All we have to do is open the vault, which could be tricky, and it would be really awkward for the game if the main questline of Wastelanders was about forcibly breaking into a high security vault. Okay, okay, but is there a good reason why Wastelanders insists that we are emerging from the vault after waking from a coma, which we could not have survived? It's so that this sign makes sense. No, seriously, this sign only functions if there are still people leaving the vault. Which isn't possible, as established, so the sign is pointless. But the sign has to be there so that players are properly pointed towards the Wastelanders content if they start their character after April of 2020. In essence, because Bethesda wants to forcibly insert Wastelanders before the main quest, they have to thoroughly and fundamentally retcon their own story. But, okay, at least there has to be a valid reason why Wastelanders needs to come first, right? The Wastelanders story has to be better than the main quest, and the features of Wastelanders needs to address prompt and accurate criticism of the launch version that I fully agree with, right? We meet with one of the Mr. Handies who points us towards a couple of women at the bottom of a flight of stairs. You might think that is a useless bit of synopsis, like I'm dragging out the length of this video, however, there are women down there, human women, that you can talk to. I know this sounds crazy, like I watched American Psycho one too many times, but that is the key feature Wastelanders is trying to sell to us. Human NPCs. Yes, actually, Bethesda decided to destroy their own premise so that one of the first things you encounter in Fallout 76 are human characters. Now, the problem with that isn't immediately apparent, but becomes obviously so as we progress. Please, drink this well water, it has most certainly not been poisoned. There were many criticisms which Fallout 76 and Bethesda received after the game launched, so much so in fact that it was easy to forget some of that criticism in favor of remembering the fun stuff like bugs, 50 gigabyte patches, and canvas bags. One of the things I found strange, but had almost completely slipped my mind until I had played this game for myself, was the criticism of the initial lack of human NPCs. It had been years since I had heard about this, and I had actually not been particularly impressed by the criticism at the time. There is a schism in the role-playing game community, which largely formed in the 2000s and became subtly divisive after, I would argue, the peak popularity of Bioware. The schism has to do with the role that dialogue plays in RPGs. Now, if you trace things back to tabletop, then what is considered essential for a role-playing game will largely depend on the group. There are people who enjoy chair RP, where they sit for hours talking to people and advancing things through dialogue. And then there are people who play GURPS, slam some numbers down on a piece of paper, and throw characters into a wood chipper because they want to experience some right and proper combat. Generally speaking, what happened is that an increasing number of people have come under the impression active tense, since I believe this to still be the case, that an RPG requires dialogue to be considered part of the genre. In other words, no dialogue, no role-playing. Now granted, I can certainly understand the argument. The problem is that perception continued to grow and began to fester. Fallout 76 did not cease to be an RPG just because there weren't human characters, dialogue, and skill checks. Arguably, its failures as an RPG has more to do with a lack of consequential decisions and character progression rather than a lack of fake human interaction. Wastelanders did not solve this problem by shoving characters and skill checks in. There is very little integration to how any of this works. There are a few locations which have been repurposed for human life that didn't exist prior, and even they feel stilted and out of place. Most human interactions, however, are random encounters. You find an unnamed settler or raider, you might get an intelligence or charisma check that might do something, and then as soon as you leave, that person ceases to exist. In other words, the same level of importance as the insult bot. Target acquired. Your damn 
vending machines prices are outrageous. The only worst deal I've seen is the hand. You were Do not put the thing in. I got put it in my inventory. Leave him. That's for putting garbage in my inventory. Of course, it was never as simple as just adding the missing puzzle piece. Just drop in the missing characters and bam, it's a fully fledged Fallout game. The puzzle piece was never missing. People mistook the absence as a technical limitation even though every sign in the game indicated that it was extremely intentional that there weren't supposed to be people here. And I don't believe for a second any Bethesda devs who have said otherwise are being truthful. If you got a mountain of criticism about your new mustache, wouldn't you also say that you were just experimenting and had always planned to shave it? I can certainly understand the people playing in 2018 struggling through a game that was having constant issues with functionality, not really paying attention to the finer points. And I'm not coming here to say that Fallout 76 had a Mastercraft story. I've got problems aplenty with how its main storyline did things, but it's also got its merits. The main questline of 76 is the best storyline that is in the game. If I were to rate the stories, all of the DLC storylines having their ratings combined would still be less than the base game. Here's the thing. Fallout 76 has an experimental storyline. I think it's really interesting that Bethesda attempted to tell the story. The war happened, but not much of it seemed to reach West Virginia. You know, we come out of the vault and everyone is just missing. There's no people around. There are signs of people surviving in post-war Appalachia, but something has obviously happened to them since then. In order for that to work, there has to not be people here. At the very least, if there are people, then they can't appear until after the point in the story when we reach Morgantown. It would probably be best if a DLC that added NPCs did so in a completely new area. But, problem. Wastelanders is addressing a core criticism of Fallout 76. A bad criticism, but a popular criticism nonetheless. In order to establish credibility as being the update to fix the game, Fallout 76 has to shove human characters into the player's face as fast as possible. I mean, it doesn't have to do that artistically, only financially. So, to cover our bases, we'll redirect players' initial quests to encounter people, we'll shove in tons of random events to catch players who may already be past that point, and we'll tie some in-game progression to doing the Wastelanders questline. It might be cynical, but we've got microtransactions to sell. As a result, not only do you heavily encourage players to do a legitimately terrible questline first, but you also undermine some of the game's only interesting content at the same time. And, in addition, you give new players a false impression about the standard of quality. See, we're being directed down to a bar called The Wayward to do a four-part questline, although that itself is being generous, given one of the parts is just to show up. But if you want the Overseer's Log, you have to do the first part. It's a false impression because, aside from each update's main storyline, there is nowhere in the game that handles content like this. If you were playing this for the first time and did this questline, you might get slightly excited for what all stories the game has to offer before realizing that Bethesda was actually being deceitful. And, for a false impression, this is little more than Fallout 4's table scraps. If you're cynical, you might say that is a sign, however, it could just as easily be assumed that the game is taking it easy, and easing the player in, and not that the quests are actually just substanceless. So let's break this down. We have our initial meeting with the two ladies who indicate they're searching for treasure and that they've got a tip off from the wayward, but they're going to stay up here and just die, I guess, until they figure out how to break into the vault. After reaching the wayward, we see the familiar scene of a bartender being harassed and needing our intervention. However, not really, as despite having several options, including three skill checks, all options terminate in the same outcome. The man gets shot to death by the bouncer. However, a funny side effect of Fallout 76 is that, because you can't save and load, you have to play multiple characters or read the quest pages to note details like that. So it's not immediately apparent that nothing you do matters, despite the fact that this is the first Bethesda game to force players to play in commitment mode. Okay, so finally we're allowed to go about the main quest, right? Super annoying or anything, but it's enough. But after it's enough. seeing Appalachia for myself, you have to I need to make sure the, every resident of 76 has a safe haven sure they can start from. Dungeon that you're, uh, I'll make do without preparing it. a little bit. Alright, I 
think I'm good. Not that it really matters. Oh wait, I gotta... If it's still standing, the town of Flatwoods is Wait, the note, the road. hollow note knew to stop Find while I was me. laying down. This is the Overseer, signing off. Well, the Overseer wants a word to make sure there's no suspense about her being dead, of course. But if we aren't level 20, then she'll suggest we go do the main quest to get experience first. I believe the intended progression is that we would do the Wayward quests and explore the forest so that by the time we reached Sutton and the Overseer, we'd be level 20 and she could go send us off to go do the Wastelander storyline instead. That is inherently reliant on us not being completely uninterested in assisting the Wayward and only coming back to do the quests when we decided to play the quests in release order. So, now that any sense of natural flow has been completely and utterly bombarded from orbit, we may finally begin to engage with Fallout 76 as it actually is, and not the facade the DLC pretends it is. Pretending all the people we have seen thus far did not exist, Delphine and Esbern set out to uncover the mystery of where all of the people in Appalachia went, and if Parthenax had killed them. We meet a woman named... Um... Uh, you know what, it doesn't matter. There's a woman in Flatwoods, repping some gear belonging to a faction called the Responders. Yeah, Wastelanders also decided to add characters like this occasionally to the main quest. You don't have to talk to her, you don't even have to acknowledge that she exists, but she's here anyways. So even if we try to pretend that there's a mystery about people being missing, the game will not allow us. It is genuinely as though the game wants us to feel like we are LARPing as people doing the main quest, repeating the steps of the actual players who did it, and these characters are maintaining all the tourist attractions. It's even funnier when Zarek Zacharon in my server's channel for Fallout 76 independently made the same LARPing comparison. The kiosk here, yeah it's genuinely a tourist trap, the kiosk guides us through the process of volunteering and joining the responders. The responders were, as the name implies, first responders in the post-war who would aggregate and distribute resources and respond to threats to the survivors. We get a pretty quick feel for the faction. They used a lot of automation to cover themselves. The industry in West Virginia was designed to support a much larger population, so they leveraged that to keep everyone fed and generally spend their time volunteering out of the goodness of their heart. It's a pretty logical faction that makes sense. They had a lot of resources, and they had pre-war sensibilities, so they had no problem sharing those resources with those in need. What could have gone wrong? Well, the game answers pretty quick, as once we are initiated through their automated recruitment process, we get sent to Morgantown. Morgantown has been wiped out by a foe that we've been seeing for a while, the Scorched. It seems that while the responders were good-natured people, the Scorched were not. Of course, there's another one of those NPCs Wastelanders added at the site of the radio broadcast station where a distress call is being played on a loop. Okay, imagine it. There is a radio distress call playing. It loops once every minute, endlessly. Whatever happened, it's already over, and may have been for some time. You never could have helped. You realize that you've been listening to a dead person. When they made the transmission, maybe they thought someone was going to make it here in time. A faction of people who always tried to help out and do the right thing, and when they needed help, no one answered the call, and it killed them. The only reason the transmission hasn't been shut off is because whatever killed them is still there. There is nobody here but the Scorched. Hey partner, welcome to the tourist attraction. Just let me check your wristband there to make sure you paid. You're good, thank you sir. Yes, I have kept this transmission playing for a year. I am trying to honor the dead here, sir. I think you can see the tonal problems with this. Not only is Morgantown the eerie side of a final stand, there's even an event where you can replay the final moments of the responders, but this time beating back the Scorched. We even see our first sign of part Parthena! So it might be obvious at this point, but the Scorched are basically zombies. The people aren't missing and they weren't killed by the Scorched, the missing people are the Scorched. While it is probably pretty obvious for us, I think that coming to that realization just by playing through the areas and making observations would be really cool. But it isn't. Half because it's poorly done, but half because Wastelanders sabotaged it. Morgantown was where I solidly felt that I had a choice to make with my playthrough, and there wasn't any hesitation on my part. I could continue to play the drivel I had been presented by Wastelanders, 
or I could continue the part that I did find genuinely interesting and play through Fallout 76's main quest. And it was not a decision. Everything screamed at me that the base game had done it better. The world building and storytelling had come together. I was genuinely interested to see how the game would go about telling its story without human characters. Even if I had a feeling that it might not be the best. But, most of all, this was a main quest where I was not going to be asked to pointlessly cover the same ground over and over. Each time we had done the main quest up to that point, we had ended up somewhere new where we could get into fights, loot buildings, and see the world. This is probably my favorite Bethesda game world since the Shivering Isles, so the main quest being less rigidly structured in favor of simply guiding us through the world they had crafted was appealing to me. One of our early play sessions was literally to just complete a loop that looked interesting on the map, but more than anything, it was the obvious cynicism of Wastelanders that repelled me from doing those quests and making the decision to do the content in release order. Appalachia is an interesting world. It has six distinct regions which are separated by actually tangible level divisions and environmental hazards. I would say that the game was absolutely at its strongest when we were going through the world and seeing what it had to offer. Perhaps one of the most interesting realizations was that the lake we had been traveling towards on the paper map was no longer there. Hmm, I did not think about the fact that the map might be wrong about certain geographic features of the map, like for instance this lake that's not here. And even better was that later there was a story for why that was. So I don't quite get what's going on with the water in this world. I don't know either. The bombs dropped. All the water's irradiated, but all the riverbeds seem dried out. So that implies that there's less of a water supply? Like there's not enough snow melt to fill rivers? This is actually a subversion of my expectations because I was just expecting either no answer or a stupid one for why the rivers seem to dry up, but it actually has something to do with the main storyline. The map uses vertical cliff faces and valleys in a way that appropriately channels you to new areas. We never ran into a high-level area we weren't supposed to be in until after we already passed the level requirement. Coming into Charleston was a great experience, in large part because of the verticality of the city making exploration interesting. But this poses a conceptual problem for Starfield. Fallout 76 is a well-crafted world that was done by hand, but Starfield is going to use procedural generation. I do not think that is a bad thing. I just think that Bethesda knows that their fans will pitch a fit about immersion the second they begin to notice the seams between the handcrafted areas and the proc gen areas, and my worry is that they will mute their world designer's creativity in order to create a seamless, albeit bland, experience. Space is a great setting to see some interesting sights, and I hope I'm not going to be looking forward to a bunch of consistently grey and red rocks. Charleston sits right at the edge of the ash heap, while Morgantown was up by the edge of the Toxic Valley. So not only will the trip between the two places see you traveling the full length of the forest, but each location also provides the opportunity to adventure into a more dangerous mid-level region by choice. I love that the main questline is getting us out into the world, without forcing us to just start other questlines. We also can't fast travel to the next leg, we have to complete the journey down to Charleston at some point which would take three hours by car. And Fallout 76 has a pretty good soundtrack to boot. If it seems like I'm being unusually charitable, that's because I am. I like this game a lot more than I like Fallout 3 and maybe even Fallout 4. I know, it's stiff competition, right? But the strongest exploration experience is eventually weighted down by the gameplay shackled to its legs. And unlike the previous Bethesda games, modding cannot bail you out this time. Introducing Fallout First! Fallout First is a subscription service where you pay $13 a month to gain access to a number of convenience features. It's pay to win, even though the game isn't directly competitive because the service is paying to solve problems that Bethesda invented for this game. Some of these services include private and custom worlds. Custom and private worlds are still inherently tied to Bethesda's network and general rules on modding, which is to say, as long as it doesn't affect other players or give you an unfair advantage, it is permitted. Some of the mods I saw on the top list over on the Nexus would seem to strain that definition, but the fact remains that things like patching and combat overhauls are big no-nos. 
Private worlds are the same rules and progression as public worlds, just with access being limited to a Fallout First subscriber and their friends. Custom worlds have their own independent progression. You can import a public character into the custom world, but once they are there, they are separate. Custom worlds can then be modified under a set of predefined modifications, including difficulty. If you don't want to pay extra, then you will be locked into the public world difficulty, which of course is set to what feels like the easy setting from Fallout 4. But even then, this isn't really an option because it would have been an immense mistake for Private Sessions and I to take ourselves to Private Sessions just because the game was ludicrously easy. We wouldn't have been able to emerge from that world after level 50 when we began participating in public events, and may have been prevented from completing the game. It is pretty funny that the company known for leaving it up to fans to do half of their design work decided to make a multiplayer game, and when they added the ability to modify game elements, quarantined those people. Sad part is, the public events ended up being fun, but had we done our progression in the custom world, we probably never would have experienced them. Alright, so let's break down the problems with Fallout 76's gameplay. A lot of it stems from an inherent lack of difficulty in the game's three main loops, that being your short-term, medium-term, and long-term difficulty. A bad game might fail in one of these categories, which can drag down the others. 76 fails in all three categories. Short-term difficulty is your second-to-second -second gameplay. Aforementioned, the gameplay difficulty is set very low. While that makes the game accessible, it also means there's no incentive for players who are not challenged to learn or fully utilize the mechanics. This makes the gameplay terminally boring, which gradually eats into the positive aspects. Fun thing to note was that I was simultaneously doing a full Outer Worlds Supernova playthrough. The main thing I note here is that Supernova, at least early on, pushes players to try and make full use of the mechanics provided as the difficulty requires it. Fallout 76 does not because of its fundamental lack of challenge at the smallest increment of difficulty. I wasn't even using VATS to help supplement my damage by taking advantage of critical hits until after 35 hours, when I had hit level 50, which is the level soft cap. Instead of seeing VATS as something that every playstyle uses, I thought VATS was just what you used if you invested into perception. I knew so little, I didn't even know most of the VATS perk cards were under luck. I barely even made use of stealth damage modifiers because it simply was not necessary to do so. I am neither inclined to learn the mechanics nor forced to do so, and so I didn't. That is how the game is when one plays solo. If one attempts to play the multiplayer game with multiple players, you will find the game is not adjusting its difficulty to compensate. Nope, okay, Google, that. do I need flood insurance in Charleston, West Virginia? By that I mean adding more enemies or health to enemies based on the number of players in an area. Granted, I'll freely admit that Private Sessions loots as he explores, whereas I loot after clearing areas. What that means is that I would clear 80% of the enemies by myself while he was still in the initial rooms being a loot goblin. Might as well, the two playstyles actually complemented each other. The game does not adapt its difficulty by spawning more enemies to stand against multiple players, or if it does, I literally could not tell from when I went to the same area solo. When we did fight together, nothing could stand the onslaught of two protagonists. We literally tore through the entire game until we hit a wall that demanded eight or more players worth of DPS. Those players proceeding to kill Parthenax faster than private sessions could fast travel to the fight. The game lacks difficulty in the second to second, which in turn affects the longer forms of difficulty supremely. Minute to minute gameplay is your short term resource management. Perhaps most baffling to me was ammunition. It was bizarre to me how many opportunities for interesting gameplay there was to be had here that Bethesda did not seem to be bothering with. Ammo is infinite, barring exceptions with a couple heavy weapons. While that is true in the other 3D Fallout games, because there are vendors and respawning enemies, you have to go out of your way to grind to achieve effective infinite ammo in those games. In 76, ammo is thrown at the player at such extreme regularity that if one were to want more, they simply need equip the weapon. 50 caliber ball. Alright, so I only have three of those. Oh, you'll, you'll start getting them, don't worry. <laughs> Oh, what the fuck? Yeah, did the weapon pop up on screen for you too? Yeah. <laughs> he 
He's got a weapon. Hey, there we go. 50 cal. And alien blaster rounds. Yeah, I gain like 10 shots for every one I take. <laughs> Early on, we were attacked by a Scorched carrying an axe. I got excited about this until I looted him and saw a pitchfork. The neat thing about Bethesda's games was that you could loot the items off of people that you could see them wearing or using. But in Fallout 76, loot tables are generated posthumously and per player. This means Esburn and I could both loot two different types of ammo off of the same enemy. If an enemy or container can drop ammo, that ammo will sometimes change to fit the player's needs. This seems to have been the result of post-launch updating and wasn't always the case. You would think that ammo would be scarce to encourage more intelligent weapon usage, in-game economies, and progression centered around the manufacturing of new ammo. But players can freely make more ammo at workstations, unlocked by default, with recipes they already know, and resources which are extremely plentiful. If ammo were scarce, players would get excited about the prospect of learning how to make it, or learning how to reload spent casings. A box of primers could be an exciting reward. Instead, ammo is infinite, especially for my preferred shotgun build, although I later used a variety of weapons and reported near infinity for them as well. That's America's housing market. The big exceptions were typically explosive weapons. Because the game is very easy, and because the player is showered in ammo, I always came back to camp with more ammo than I had left with, and inevitably infinite ammo. Some of the only fun I had was when I decided to start using 40mm grenade launchers just because there wasn't an ammo surplus for that ammo type. The other categories of resource management do not fear much better. Because enemies rarely do significant damage, and because stim packs are very common, healing items also ended up being in a massive surplus. The lack of challenge meant any kind of performance enhancing substance was not worth the effort of diving into the inventory. Water was a joke. We ended up happening to start playing a couple days before a holiday event that gave us both plans for a vintage water cooler, capable of generating purified water without any need for power or heavy restriction on placement. This is so stupid. Hmm. <laughs> Just... And they don't even cost, like, anything. Molded plastic, which I have an absurd amount of, and wooden scrap, which is like probably the most common material in the game. Oh god, my frame rate's lagging around all of these water coolers now. Uh oh, how many did you put down? Uh, one, two, three. 47. Nice. <laughs> Placing more doesn't increase the rate they generate water, but it does mean I can come back after a couple days to find myself in possession of enough water to last real world days. Someone should probably have told the Capital Wasteland about these. Jokes aside, even without the water cooler, it's hard to imagine purified water being any kind of scarce, and alternative juices and teas are plentiful. I did like that there were stat incentives to using alternatives over the near-infinite water being passively generated, but there was also no consequence for being thirsty, which me and many players discovered far too late. Food was better but also plentiful, nothing ever pressured me into actually dipping into my canned dog food pile, which actually ended up being an issue with the story when the overseer tried to claim that she had helped us by leaving stashes of canned dog food everywhere. Food also has unique effects, but I only learned that ribeye steaks give strength bonuses because early on, encumbrance was such an issue that getting a strength fortification was a big deal. How surprising that a limitation of my character incentivized me to learn more about the mechanics. I should be looking at all critters as walking stat buffs, but because the combat benefits of most food are pointless in a game this easy, I look at meat as just extra carry weight, most of which will spoil before I use it due to how much food I already have. I think if you are playing a co-op survival game and the words, hey, can I have some of your food, never get said, then you have a food security issue. I do not start bleeding from the eyes for being slightly thirsty and there are benefits for keeping my stats capped, so credit where it's due I guess. 
but it was very easy to forget this was supposed to be a survival game. There's no difficult medium term resource management, which in turn means that there's no player economy. In order for player economies to function, there has to be something which value can be placed upon. There also has to be outlets which routinely delete the currency, otherwise player actions will continually add more money to the supply and drive inflation. 76 controls inflation by arbitrarily limiting caps to a max of 40,000, but the game does little else to help foster any sense of economy. As an example, like I said, the resource management is non-existent. When ammo used to be scarce, players would list the types they didn't use for sale for one cap per round, meaning that players could continually trade the currency they were earning for goods. The price was driven low by high supply because all players could easily fabricate large amounts of ammo in about 20 minutes, but this was still an economy motivated at least by mild inconvenience. Today, most player sales seem to be centered around plans. Endgame players, to avoid hitting the cap, cap, spend their excess above 35k on plans for various items, even if they don't plan on ever building them. Some of these are only available for limited times, providing actual value to players who did not play when they were available. The most valuable thing I owned was a spare plan for the vintage water cooler, because it was a limited time seasonal item. That is about it. Players are generally not trading stim packs, kims, food, or water. I set up a player shop with common amenities near the starting area and noted that my only sales which weren't crafting plans were to players below level 50, who probably just didn't know better yet. However, the economy is not limited to player trade. There are also NPCs which trade items in exchange for caps. This is a great way to get money out of circulation, however nothing that is worth having ever seems to be sold. As an example, for about four hours I was in great need of screws. None of the merchants seemed to sell them, so a scarcity problem that could have been solved by caps wasn't. At another point, for repairs, we were in need of ballistic fiber. That is sold by merchants, but for extreme prices. We looked up ways to get fiber instead and found easy methods to get what would have been thousands of caps worth of fiber in a couple minutes. The NPC economy is arbitrary and has not adjusted the prices of what is actually valuable to players, nor how valuable it should be. Say you price an item at 100 caps. If that item is something that players can find in the world, then it becomes a race between how quickly the player can generate that resource versus how quickly they can generate 100 caps. You can find ballistic fiber faster than you can make the caps needed to pay for it. The only reason I wanted to buy screws was that they were hard to farm on demand until I got into the event where everybody farmed screws, got 250, and never needed them again. Instead of trying to update and tune the economy to handle these market realities, Bethesda has largely given up and just allowed the current system of players looking up 5-minute farm locations to generate resources. This means caps are effectively meaningless, and in turn, there's no interesting long-term strategy to Fallout 76. You can generate 1400 caps per day from passive water generation and excess chems. Although later, one star legendary items started to be the only thing I sold since they consumed the most stash space. Later on, there's a merchant who will sell a special currency used to buy more plans. You are limited to spending 6000 caps per week at this merchant, meaning that it was extremely trivial to outpace this market drain. The most challenging long-term mechanic in this game is simply inventory management. There is a scarcity of stash space and encumbrance which can lead to lengthy sections of sitting around trying to cram more trash into the can. Again, remember, the surplus of resources was only made possible by the lack of difficulty leading up to this point. If stim packs were harder to get and more necessary to survive, some players would make their income by creating and selling stim packs in mass. They would use that money to then buy ammunition from other players, and thus a circular economy would start to function where players fulfill the resource weaknesses of other players. But even setting that aside, Fallout 76 is abysmal to play because it lacks challenge on the mechanical, tactical, and strategic fronts. Players bad at combat but good at strategy could gain an edge by focusing on efficiency and long-term resource management. Players good at combat but bad at resource management could perform the inverse, making ends meet by selling resources to trade-focused players. Instead, every player is a one-man machine that can easily do everything, and it's boring as a consequence. The funniest part was the realization that there was a limit on the number of things you can do per day. In-game for me was constantly juggling items into and out of my stash. I would get heavy legendary items that cannot be scrapped, they could only be sold. 
but there was a limit on how many of these I could sell per day and it became very tedious. I realized that the stack of awful legendary items I would occasionally see abandoned at event sites were players who gave up on trying to use the whole animal and just abandoned the literal garbage that they had been accumulating. And inventory management is really only a challenge if you're a hoarder. If Bethesda were smart, they could implement a gameplay difficulty system that rewards people playing on the higher difficulties with more experience. I actually don't understand why this isn't already the case. See, the One Wasteland update changed the level scaling system. It used to be that enemy levels were determined by the player who spawned them. That started creating problems as the average player level went past the point that lower level players could handle. A high level player could walk through an area and inadvertently create a difficulty trap for new players. Now it works by scaling every enemy to the level of the player, a sort of quantum level determined by the observer. There are some minimums to keep low level players out of high level areas, but generally enemy levels are per person, even if two people are fighting the same enemy. I would imagine the system works by calculating the amount of damage you do, translating that to a percentage loss, and then sending it to the other players in order to accurately portray health loss on their side. So, if you can do that, it's not a stretch to assume you could then change those values to be per player. All that playing on hard does in Fallout 4 is give the enemy a multiplier against their base health. I imagine the only concern is, what happens when I play on very hard and Private Sessions plays on very easy? Do I still receive the XP bonus despite being carried by someone who can one-shot every enemy? It is a system that could be gamed, but considering the existing lack of value anyways, it really wouldn't matter. Just put an exception to difficulty health values on legendary enemies and you'll cut out 90% of the cheese but keep all of the benefits. Instead, players who could handle more are relegated to hours of tedium for the occasional fun fight. When people were talking about the previous Bethesda game's lack of tangible progression, making it feel like the tires are spinning yet the vehicle is not moving, this is the logical endpoint of that observation. The only difference between level 1 and level 50 was access to power armor and heavy weapons. I guess we can talk about leveling in Fallout 76. Levels means special points up to level 50, so 49 attribute points to allocate over the course of the game. Special then allows you to equip perk cards, for example Shotgunner is a strength card, and each level of the card requires an additional point invested in strength. I didn't hate it because it means that there is some build variety and if you want to switch playstyles you'll need to start leveling for a while to unlock all of the cards you need. However, you can change these cards on the fly for no cost. There's only a minor inconvenience if you don't have the special points you need to equip a card. An example would be equipping cards that allow you to unlock doors only when you find those locked doors. Because of the ease of the game, I found it prudent to invest myself only in cards which gave me more utility and only invested in actually making my character better at combat far later into the game. Yes, it was this easy, even without increasing my damage. This was part one of a four-part edit of my Fallout 76 video. I didn't say series, because it wasn't meant to be serialized. Yet here we are. If you want to see the full cut, uncensored, at an even 4 hours 20 minutes, head over to my or Private Sessions membership platforms. You only have to pay one of us to get both videos. Otherwise, part two comes out next Friday. Simple explanation. YouTube has flip-flopped on its guidelines multiple times just in the stretch I've been making this video. That, and Skyrim Act 2 getting manually clipped, has motivated me to take on a defensive posture. I still want to do my thing, but if YouTube wants me to just guess what I did wrong in a video that is literally 11 hours long, then I'll need to segment my videos so that I can better gauge what the problem is. Going forward, my policy is to make the full version for adults available for patrons. On a positive note, go check out Private Sessions' video, which will be premiering after this one. EP, whatever. Oh boy, the game's lagging. This is gonna be some nice footage, I'll tell you why. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, no complaining. <laughs> Drink to gain positive effects. Drink what? Oh, I think it was telling me to get to drink the beer. What the fuck is this music? It's just like a dude with a hammer banging on sheet metal.
Are you like, sure that's not actually happening? No, it just sounds like an ambient track. And no, there was that uh, it does the doc, uh, podcast where the guy talked about how he used like a sound of a him banging on the side of his washing machine as a, like a sound effect for everything. <laughs> 